Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay, guys, we all know uh, Princep was a Kevlar Princep assassinated. Archduke Franz Ferdinand kind of kicked off all of the uh, mobilization of World War I, right? But what happened before that? That's what I'm trying to figure out, okay? Great, the Great War, great channel. Original link to the video, if I didn't already say this, top of the description. Preemptive like. My name's Connor, if you're new. I like to learn things and watch stuff. If you are not ready to learn, you're watching the wrong video. Or you can teach me. Or sit in the back of the class and draw things. Let's go, guys. O oops, did I let it play? Let's go. I'm ready to learn. I had a cup of coffee, if you can't tell. I, I can't I can't hear anything. Um Civil operations in the dark. Thank you. Okay. Sorry guys. Mass use of artillery, a grinding strategic stalemate, the first use of combat aircraft, and naval operations in the Dardanelles. I'm not talking about the First World War, but a war just before it that marked a major turning point in European geopolitics and in the history of warfare. It destabilized the Balkans and moved the great powers of Europe further down the road of rivalry, distrust, and militarization. It's the Italo-Turkish War of 19. 1911-1912. Such a good channel. Hi, I'm Jesse Alexander and welcome hey, to The Great War. Following Italian unification in 1871, nationalist movements in the New Kingdom continued to call for further expansion. Under the wow, so it, it happened at the same time of the uh, Franco-Prussian War. Banner of New, New Kingdom continued to call for further expansion. Under the banner of New Italy, nationalists dreamed of the reconstitution of the Roman Empire through imperial expansion in the Mediterranean. But it was Britain and France who ended up expanding their influence in the region in the late 19th century. Italian imperialists looked on with dismay in 1882 as France took control of Tunisia and Britain occupied Egypt. The Moroccan crisis of summer 1911 was a clear sign that imperial competition in the Mediterranean was still alive and well. This left Ottoman Libya, the provinces of Tripolitania, Cyrenaica, and Fezzan, as the one viable Italian target in North Africa, and some Italians worried the French or British might take it before they had the chance. Italy did expand its soft power via banks, schools, and hospitals in Libya, but diplomats like Tommaso Titoni called for military action. Tripolitania is necessary to Italy for the Mediterranean balance. We could wait if there were not the danger that we might lose it, and indeed, we waited patiently until such danger appeared on the horizon. Today, this danger begins to take shape, and with the passage of time, it will grow more severe. Thus, the occupation of Tripolitania imposes itself upon us as an unavoidable necessity. The Ottomans knew about Italy's ambitions and tried to avoid the worst by granting Italy economic concessions. But these offers couldn't hide the empire's weakness. It had suffered decades of economic and military decline. Yeah, if you just offer them concessions then to Italy, well, then the French and the British are just going to take it, right? And Tripolitan Tri Tripolitania is same as Tripoli? Okay. The worst by granting Italy economic concessions, but these offers couldn't hide the empire's weakness. It had suffered decades of economic and military decline and political divisions caused by the Young Turk Revolution of 1908 and failed counter coup by the Sultan in 1909. Ottoman minister to Rome, Seyf Eddin Bey, understood things with Italy were unlikely to end at the negotiating table. The concessions that we make to the Italians in our African provinces will do nothing but increase their appetite and offer them occasion to intervene. Italian appetite is not satiable, and whatever concessions or facilitations will be fatally followed by others. 
In this way, the sacrifices that we might undertake will have no outcome but to represent temporary satisfactions without lasting effects. With tensions rising in 1911, that we might undertake fatally followed by others. but to represent temporary satisfactions without lasting effects. So the Ottomans are saying that, that, that you know, if, if, if they're only going to want more and more unless we take a stand. With tensions right? rising in 1911, Italian Prime Minister Giovanni Gilotti and Foreign Minister Antonio di San Giuliano went on a public relations and diplomatic offensive to win over nationalist support. The press reported on Ottomans' supposed insults to Italian commercial interests and citizens in Libya, which were grossly exaggerated. Giolitti, though, was still cautious. The nationalists imagined that Tripoli is the territory of a poor black simpleton whom a European state can dethrone as he wishes. But Tripoli is a province of the Ottoman Empire, and the Ottoman Empire is a great European power. Despite his hesitations, Giolitti felt he was running out of time. Not only was there the danger of French or British action, but Italy's allies were against weakening the Ottomans. Austria-Hungary wanted stability in the Balkans, and Germany wanted a strong Ottoman Empire in case of war with the Entente. So the Italian government struck a deal with the French. France wouldn't interfere in Libya, and Italy wouldn't interfere in Tunisia and Morocco. Meanwhile, the Ottomans had actually moved troops away from uh, with the French, case of war with the Entente. So the Italian government struck a deal with the French. France wouldn't interfere in Libya, and Italy wouldn't interfere in Tunisia and Morocco. Meanwhile, the Ottomans had actually moved troops away from Libya to deal with a rebellion in Yemen, though they did bring in weapons to arm the locals in Libya in anticipation of the coming conflict. On September 27, 1911, Giolitti gave the Ottomans an ultimatum based on supposed bias against Italian business interests. Agree to Italian occupation of Libya within 24 hours or face military action. So Italy had thrown down the gauntlet in its quest for imperial glory in Libya. The Ottoman government offered some further concessions, but the Italians rejected them and the ultimatum expired on September 28th. It would be war. The Italo-Turkish war began with a. It seems like th this is a, this is a lot of times that that happens and and throughout history that I've learned about, where a country that just wants a fight and wants to go to war no matter what, will just deny any concession or even um, uh, provide. Un, untenable, uh, uh, untenable wishes, like like a, a like a trade that just is not fair, just because like they know they're gonna deny it and they want to go to war, but this just makes them seem a little less warmongering and more like, hey, they just kept denying our our uh, demands or our you know. Why can't I think of the word? Our uh, attempts to like, you know, settle it when it seems like all along you, you just want to fight them. Just you don't want to seem like this giant immediate aggressor. Does that make sense? It would be war. The Italo-Turkish war began with a somewhat reluctant sounding announcement from Giolitti. The Italian government, therefore, finding itself forced to safeguard its dignity and its interests, has decided to proceed to the military occupation of Tripoli and Cyrenaica. This solution is the only one which Italy can accept. The Italian military like now that. had to arrange an invasion on extremely short notice, since they weren't fully aware of government plans until September. All the same, between October 3rd and 21st, 1911, 25,000 Italian troops landed along the coast. Oh my god, it's just like the Romans, right? Who wanted to attack Carthage? They, they did like the same thing, right? Like, uh, am I thinking of the right thing? 
and captured 1911, 25,000 Italian troops landed along the coast and captured Tripoli, Tobruk, Berna, Benghazi, and Homs. At first, Ottoman resistance was generally light since they were outgunned and outnumbered. The Italian landings had been successful, but advancing into the Libyan hinterland would prove far more difficult. The Italians knew so little about the interior that some of their planning documents even used ancient sources like Caesar for topographic and demographic information. There it is. Italian leaders hoped that by seizing the towns, they could force the Ottomans to surrender. Instead, the Ottomans simply withdrew in good order beyond the range of Italian naval guns. As Italian soldier Innocenzo Bianchi wrote, the invasion barely seemed to be a war at all. I believe that it is not real war, but little attacks, and soon we shall overcome. Overall, I'm very happy, and you'll see that it will be finished very soon. Don't go too far into the desert. Bianchi was killed in action just six days later. One factor the Italian plan had not taken into account was the local Arab population. Italian planners assumed that the Arabs would welcome them as liberators from Ottoman oppression and did not expect local resistance, which turned out to be a mistake. So by late October, the Italians were feeling confident. They'd captured the coast and the Ottomans had seemingly fled the field. But instead of capitulating as the Italians expected, the Ottomans and Arabs made common cause. Militarily, the Italians seemed to be in a strong position. The Italian conscripts brought with them several new pieces of equipment, like their modern grey-green uniform and the Modelo 91 magazine rifle. Both of these pieces of kit, with Light some time. modifications, would actually continue in service until 1945. The Italians also had the support of the large naval guns of the Italian ships offshore. What are these things on, on the wheels of, of these artillery guns? I love seeing, I love seeing the, the kind of transitory from, uh, like, it looks like a Napoleonic era cannon, but it doesn't. I love seeing the evolution of artillery. I think it's fascinating. I feel like artillery in World War I, like, looked extra terrifying, although I'm sure artillery in World War II was much more efficient. Um... But was, was this just so that when it recoiled, it wouldn't break the wheels or like it wouldn't recoil too far back because it, it's not completely round. So maybe that's why it just makes it so like it wouldn't like go back 10 feet when you shot it or something. As well as Maxim machine guns and German built Krupp artillery. Estimates of the number of Ottoman troops vary greatly. There were probably somewhere between 2,500 and 5,000 Ottoman regulars and 20 to 35,000 Arab tribesmen under the command of local sheikhs of the Senussi Sufi order. They also had German artillery, but had no heavy naval guns to back them up. Their model 1893 Mauser was considered superior to that of the Italians because of its larger caliber. British doctor Ernest Griffin was with the Turkish Red Crescent in Libya and explained why. The injuries produced by the small 6.5 mm conical bullets used by the Italians were scarcely ever severe. And if the wounds had not been infected, we had the satisfaction of soon sending our Arab patients back to their duties in the field. Ottoman forces identified what they felt was a- I really need to get more familiar with like ammunition sizes. So is that the diameter, 6.5? Weakness in the fortified Italian line near Tripoli. Forces identified what they felt was a weakness in the fortified Italian line near Tripoli. Italian trenches in this area did not run through the usual scrubland, but directly through an oasis, which could provide cover for advancing Ottoman troops. Additionally, the Italians had not built many fortifications around the settlement of Shar al Shat. On October 23rd, supported by diversionary attacks to the south, Ottoman forces attacked a six-kilometer stretch of front between Fort Sidi Mesri and the sea. Around 1,800 men of the 11th Bersaglieri Regiment defended the area and were awakened at 7 a.m. by the sound of gunfire and dogs barking. 
As the Italians scrambled to mend their positions, local Arabs came out of Shar al Shat and attacked them from behind. Italian soldier Evangelista Salvatore recalled the shock. The Saraceni seemed to rise out of the earth on every side of us. Italian reinforcements arrived late and eventually beat back the Ottomans, but Italian losses were heavy. At least 21 officers and 482 men were killed, including 250 who were massacred in a cemetery after they'd surrendered. Some of the bodies had been mutilated. Officially, the Italian general staff downplayed the setback. Our losses were not light, but justified by the result, and showed that the morale of our troops was excellent. Well, the Italian response on the ground was no. swift and brutal, as they executed around 4,000 Arabs by firing squad in the following days. Shar al Shat and other guerrilla raids caused the Italian government to increase the expeditionary force to 100,000 men, far more than planned. They even brought in Ascaris from Eritrea. Giolitti also escalated the war politically and announced the full annexation of Libya on November 5th. This well, was right. mostly with, a... with Ethiopia, I, I always hear that like Ethiopia was the one African country or area on the continent that never got colonized by Europeans. But then the Italians controlled Ethiopia after the carving up of Africa. So Ethiopia was controlled. And obviously Eritrea is, uh, Eritrea borders the Red Sea and Ethiopia, right? In Djibouti, maybe Egypt. Symbolic gesture since the Italians only controlled the coast. But historian Bruce Vandervoort argues it ensured that the war would continue. In retrospect, the annexation appears to have <laughs> virtually <laughs> November 5th. This was and announced the full annexation of Libya on November 5th. This was mostly a symbolic gesture since the Italians only controlled the coast. But historian Bruce Vandervoort argues it ensured that the war would continue. In retrospect, the annexation appears to have virtually assured that the Turks would have no option but to continue fighting. Hiccups. The Battle of Shar al Shat was a major psychological blow for Italy. They had held their position, but it was a defeat that showed the war would not be as quick as they had hoped. By the late fall. Guys, can I, I just gotta get my water quick. Sorry about that, guys. But argues it ensured that the war would continue. In retrospect, the annexation appears to have virtually assured that the Turks would have no option but to continue fighting. The Battle of Shar al Shat was a major psychological blow for Italy. They had held their position, but it was a defeat that showed the war would not be as quick as they had hoped. By the late fall of 1911, the Italo-Turkish War had ground to a stalemate. The Ottomans couldn't expel the Italians, but the Italians couldn't force a decisive battle because the Ottomans still. and Arabs began to wage a full-on guerrilla war. Italian naval supremacy also meant the Turks couldn't send reinforcements, but they did manage to sneak in shipments of arms and a small group of volunteer officers. So, oh, Mustafa Kemal, I, I, even I know him. Ataturk? When did Ataturk live? Why were the uh, British so successful in um, creating an Arab or, or uh, creating and aiding an Arab revolt against the Ottomans when the Ottomans just a few years earlier? What, when did the whole Lawrence of, Ar of Arabia stuff happen? <clears throat> when the Italians were not nearly as successful? Is it just because the Italians were using a more brute force where the British were doing more of a covert going around to different Arab tribes and Arab peoples and like saying, we can help you get rid of the Ottomans? Uh, that's probably it. It managed Mustafa. to sneak in shipments of arms and a small group of volunteer officers, including Enver Bey and Mustafa Kemal. Kemal made it to Libya by sailing to Egypt on a Russian ship and disguising himself as a journalist. 
Despite the previous struggles between the Arab tribes and the Ottomans, the two now work together against the Italian invaders. How old are war journalists? Have they been there like forever? <laughs> tribes and the Ottomans, the two now work together against the Italian invaders. Ottoman commander Enver Bey and tribal leader Sheikh Omar al-Muhtar committed to the guerrilla strategy. Keep the Italians pinned in the coastal towns and exhaust them through attrition. Kemal, who ended up being wounded in the eye, operated in the Derna sector and used his 9,000 men to keep 15,000 Italians busy. The Ottomans wanted to continue to dominate the Arabs, but also saw much value in their allies, as Enver Bey expressed. I have become the master of the situation. Into my hands has fallen a power, the Sanusia, a force for which the various powers of Europe, the Italians, the French, the English, spend millions to have in their hands. Even the Khedive had tried to appropriate and employ them against us. And thus, this force has come to me without my spending a dime. Arab leader Farhat al-Zawi made the somewhat different Arab motivations clear to a French reporter. Our men are patriots in bare feet and rags, like your soldiers of the revolution, and not religious fanatics. If the Turkish government abandons us, we will proclaim that it has forfeited its right over our country. We will form the Republic of Tripolitania. Italian commanders wanted to push into the desert, but they lacked the... So Tripolitania is just like portions of modern-day Tunisia, Algeria, and Libya, or... Or, or Tunisia and Libya, or... Uh... Intelligent... Italian commanders wanted to push into the desert, but they lacked the intelligence and logistics, had poor desert equipment, and were vulnerable to the guerrillas. So instead, they advanced little by little, digging trenches as they went, sometimes as often as every hundred meters. One British journalist called it, quote, purely imbecile. In December, the Italians tried to bring the Turks and Arabs to a decisive battle at Ain Zara, an Ottoman base on the high ground with commanding views around Tripoli. The Italian attack opened on December 4th with around 15,000 men supported by heavy artillery Machine and guns. naval guns. Two assault columns of Italian infantry advanced on the rudimentary Ottoman trenches, with one running into some severe difficulty. Why is the he defenders blind? were forced to abandon the trenches and were then hit hard in the open by Italian artillery fire. The Ottomans withdrew 40 kilometers to the south, but the Italian cavalry failed to surround them. This allowed the Ottomans to escape once again, but they did leave much of their artillery behind. The Italian authorities and government-friendly newspapers trumpeted Ain Zara as a major victory, while journalists from neutral states were quick to point out Ain Zara was only a few kilometers from the Italian lines. Even though the Ottomans lost at Ain Zara, they were becoming more confident. Time appeared to be on their side, and there was always more desert to withdraw into if need be. Meanwhile, as the Italians advanced, their morale dropped and disease spread, as Enver Bey well knew. Sometimes there come deserters who say very interesting things of the Italians. Almost every day, Italian losses from dysentery are about 20 men. The hospitals are full. The morale of the troops is low, and all want peace. From December to March, the Italians... That's crazy how I, we all always think just like having great soldiers and, and weapons and fighting and fighting is, is what's going to win. But what makes truly great powers is logistics and logistics and, and, and proper command. It's like, I, I keep learning through videos is like, you can have the best soldiers in the world, best equipped, but if they're not supplied and don't have, have, uh, what what can they do they're going to be so it, it makes me really appreciate an army's ability to keep supply lines open even more than like battle tactics maybe not as much 
you know. Italians made a few more landings to consolidate their position and to intercept Turkish gun shipments. But these actions were simply meant to boost public support back home. As the war dragged on, Italian media interests did not weaken. In fact, press coverage was unprecedented for a modern conflict, and one aspect grabbed headlines more than any other. The war in the air. The Italo-Turkish War saw the first significant wartime use of airplanes for reconnaissance and bombing. The Italian first airplane flotilla had nine machines, including Blériot and Neupart monoplanes, plus 11 pilots. On October 23rd, Captain Carlo Piazza made the first ever official combat flight when he reconnoitered Ottoman positions along the coast. And on November 1st, Italians made the first ever bombing raid when pilots dropped Cipelli grenades into the Ottoman camps. On October 25th, Ottoman gunners became the first to hit an enemy combat aircraft with anti-aircraft fire. Although such fire was usually inaccurate, Captain Giuseppe Rossi experienced a close call. We flew at an altitude of 600 meters and had covered 15 kilometers when we spotted the first group of Arab tents. These welcomed us with such a volley of accurate fire that I had half a mind to give up continuing the mission. At 100 meters away from the center of the camp, I gave the second signal. It was a wonderful sight. The bomb had erupted with the intended effect. But the joy of this perception was severely impaired by the incessant crackle of the volley of fire aimed at us. I tried to climb but was unsuccessful, and so was passing over the left side of the camp when my companion shouted that he was wounded. I had turned around to look at him when the engine stopped and we began to descend. Happily, it started again, but we were struck by two more bullets. Although aerial other than like the 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 invention or the common use of gunpowder and guns, I can't think of like a bigger crazy moment in human history warfare than like than this of just Everything in history has been either air or it has been ground forces or naval forces. And for the first time ever, honestly, ever for thousands of years, you now have the air as well. So cool. The bombing grabbed public attention. Its military effects were relatively and minor. Terrible. Reconnaissance, whether from fixed-wing aircraft or balloons, was far more valuable to Italian operations. The photos they took supplemented the limited maps of the region, and on I several you occasions, balloons, planes but... were able to discover and disrupt attempted Ottoman ambushes. But above all else, the Italian effort showed that aircraft were robust and reliable enough to be used in war. As the conflict dragged on into 1912, the Italians now looked not to the air, but to the sea to bring the conflict to an end. As the war expanded, it inevitably clashed with the interests of the other European great powers. The first targets of the Italian naval strategy to defeat the Ottomans were in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. Italy had already attacked Ottoman ports in the area in fall 1911, but in January 1912, the Italian Navy sank several Ottoman ships and delivered weapons to rebellious anti-Ottoman groups in Yemen and Arabia. In February, Italian... Hold on, guys. When, 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 when was the Suez Canal created? Uh, 1859. Oh, no, it started in 1859. 1869. Um, so it's, it's you know, a 50-year-old thing a a at this point. Um, but it, it couldn't it be very easy for the British to cut it off? And then how does the Italian Navy get into the Red Sea? Going all the way around Africa? and Ottoman ships fought a pitched naval battle on ships and delivered weapons to rebellious anti-Ottoman groups in Yemen and Arabia. In February, Italian and Ottoman ships fought a pitched naval battle in Beirut Harbor, resulting in a decisive Italian victory and 66 Beirut residents killed. In April 1912, the Italians also sent a flotilla to the Dardanelles Straits, a vital international shipping lane giving access to the Ottoman capital of Constantinople. 
Following some inconclusive duels between the Italian Navy and Ottoman shore batteries, the Ottomans closed and mined the straits to prevent a threat to the capital. Just like with the British in World War I, right, where Churchill was pissed off because the British tried to go through here and knock out Constantinople, but they got destroyed by mines. But it's likely that all of the mines that were there to destroy them had destroyed the ships, and so they probably should have go kept going on, but they turned back. Um, the Ottomans closed and mined between right the Italian Navy and Ottoman shore batteries. The Ottomans closed and mined the straits to prevent a threat to the capital. This drew the attention of Britain and especially Russia, whose economy depended on shipping passing through the Dardanelles. This put pressure on both the Italians and the Ottomans, but in the end it was the Ottomans who were forced to reopen the straits to shipping. Austria-Hungary was also worried about the war, since they wanted to keep the status quo in the Balkans, which was also enshrined in the Triple Alliance with Germany and Italy. If the Ottomans lost too badly, the Balkans might erupt. When did the Italy the Ottomans, switch though, sides? were not able to take advantage of the divisions among the Europeans. The empire was diplomatically isolated, and the young Turk regime was badly divided between those who were still loyal to the Sultan and those who supported the Revolutionary Committee of Union and Progress. Am I stupid? Did I miss something? Wasn't Italy on the... not on the German, Ottoman, Austrian side in World War I? Weren't they on the French side and German side? Yes. I mean, and, and they... The young Turk regime was badly divided between those who were still loyal to the Sultan and those who supported the Revolutionary Committee of Union and Progress. In 1911 and 1912, there were three different Grand Viziers and three different foreign ministers. But despite the political risks, Italian leadership still felt in May 1912 that naval operations were the key to victory. So much so that operations in Libya were suspended in favor of a series of amphibious landings on Turkey's doorstep. The Italian command now turned to the Ottomans' island possessions in the East Mediterranean. If they took Rhodes and the Dodecanese, Rhode Ottoman Island. routes to Libya and naval operations would be further reduced. Admiral Carlo Roccare Sorry, was I, also I got too excited because my state is called Rhode Island and it's spelt the same way. They took Rhodes and the Dodecanese, Ottoman routes to Libya and naval operations would be further reduced. Admiral Carlo Roccare was also Carlo thinking Roccare. of the diplomatic advantages as early as October 1911. I think it might be useful for us in the current war to occupy some part of the Ottoman Empire that will compel them to accept peace. Unfortunately, we do not have a free hand, and so we cannot act, for example, on the west coast of the Balkan Peninsula, or by forcing the Dardanelles go to Constantinople. But we can take some island as a bargaining counter at least. Strategically, the island of Rhodes would be most valuable. This was another risky move, since the islands were covered by the same Triple Alliance status quo agreement as the Balkans. The Italians tried to calm Austrian fears, and eventually Austria-Hungary agreed to a temporary occupation of the islands. And the Austrians only allowed even that under pressure from Germany, who wanted to strengthen the Triple Alliance before it came up for renewal in 1912. Between April 28th and May 21st, 1912, the Italians seized 13 Ottoman islands in the Aegean with nearly no opposition except on roads. The Italian gamble worked since the occupation of the islands increased Ottoman internal divisions between those who wanted to continue the struggle and those who wanted a negotiated peace. So in the summer of 1912, it seemed there might be a road to the peace table. I, I got to pee quick, guys. Be right back. Did a negotiated right, I, went, I, I washed my hands. I went back a bit. So in the summer of 1912, and those who wanted a negotiated peace. So in the summer of 1912, it seemed there might be a road to the peace table, but there were obstacles. The Italians were reluctant to compromise and had already announced Libyan annexation, while the Ottomans expected major concessions since they had not yet been fully defeated. 
Russian-led peace talks began in May but failed, and so a new round of talks began in Switzerland in June. The Ottomans were willing to accept Libya becoming an independent state within an Italian zone of occupation. Italian demands, though, were far more substantial, so the Swiss talks also fell Libya becoming an independent state in June. The Ottomans were willing to accept Libya becoming an independent state within an Italian zone of occupation. Italian demands, though, were far more substantial, so the Swiss talks also fell through. One Italian diplomat put the blame on his Turkish counterpart. How did the Ottomans get so weak? I want to learn about the Ottomans during the Age of Exploration, which made it so that they weren't as important on the Silk Road for bringing, or, you know, for, they weren't as important in the importing of goods from East Asia, South Asia to Europe. That must be where the decline started. Um, and I would really like to learn more about it after it. Through. One Italian diplomat put the blame on his Turkish counterpart. The Ottoman delegate had in his baggage only one word, autonomy. But internal pressure in Italy was also growing. The war was becoming less popular, especially among the working classes, and rumors of talks increased demands for peace. Italian soldiers were also tired of the war, and there was unrest in the trenches and even desertions. The fact that the war was costing Italy 47% of its total expenditure was also helping to turn the formerly pro-war newspapers against it. On July 18th, the Italians tried one last action to force the Ottomans to the negotiating table. Five specially camouflaged Italian torpedo boats snuck into the Dardanelles to attack the Turkish fleet at anchor, not unlike the Italian motorboat attacks against the Austro-Hungarian Navy a few years later. Ottoman sentries spotted them and drove them away, but the Italian press exaggerated the raid to make it sound like a bold strike against the heart of the enemy state. Journalist Giuseppe Bevioni was not present during the attack, but waxed poetic. The water boiled around the torpedo boats from... This is why I trust no country during wartime. I don't care if you're Israel, if you're Palestine, if you're United States, if you're Russia, if you're Ukraine, if you're China, if you're Vietnam. Like, any country I might be wanting to trust more than others, but how people present their stuff matters and you're going to want to make stuff sound better than it is i i i, I don't trust anyone in wartime i just don't stem to stern and jets of water flew high as shells fell with waxed poetic the water boiled around the torpedo boats from stem to stern and jets of water flew high as shells fell with horrible thuds, as if volcanic eruptions were flashing inexhaustibly beneath the water. The air was full of flashes of flames, explosions and splinters. Convulsive, foaming, full of glare and reflections, the sea seemed to become a huge fiery furnace. But at the zenith shone always the star of Italy. The Dardanelles raid marked the height of Italian naval adventures, and peace talks started up again in August. The new Ottoman government under Ghazi Muhtar Pasha was willing to negotiate partly because of pressure from other powers and the outbreak of the First Balkan War in early October. The Ottomans still wanted to avoid any peace deal that gave the impression that they'd abandoned the Libyan Arabs, since that might cause problems in other Arab regions of the empire. The peace treaty ending the Italo-Turkish War was signed on October 18, 1912. The Ottomans declared Libya independent to avoid accepting Italian sovereignty over it, but they would not object when Italy then declared that sovereignty. The Sultan would continue to be recognized as the religious head of Libyan Muslims. The Italians promised to return the Aegean Islands and pay some reparations. The other European powers quickly recognized Italian control over Libya. So Italy had won the Italo-Turkish War and taken 
The peace treaty ending the Italo-Turkish War was signed on October 18, 1912. The Ottomans declared Libya independent to avoid accepting Italian sovereignty over it, but they would not object when Italy then declared that sovereignty. The Sultan would continue to be recognized as the religious head of Libyan Muslims. The Italians promised to return the Aegean Islands and pay some reparations. The other European powers quickly recognized Italian control over Libya. Okay, the beginning part's confusing. The Ottomans declared Libya independent to avoid accepting Italian sovereignty over it, but they would not object when Italy then declared that sovereignty. So, just, no. Not the Sultan would continue to be recognized as the religious head of Libyan Muslims. The Italians promised to return the Aegean Islands and pay some reparations. The other European powers quickly recognized Italian control over Libya. This, this was all in one treaty? So, in the same treaty, the Ottomans declared the Libya's independence. Like, these seems like... These seem like demands or options for options to be included in a treaty, not the treaty itself. The Ottomans declared Libya's independence. The Italians said no and declared it a sovereign Italian land. Ottomans didn't do anything. Italy did return the islands like Isle of Rhodes, I'm assume, assuming, and other in the Aegean, and gave reparations. And European powers recognize Italian control over Libya. So, like, why even, why even, man, um, everything's making more and more sense. Calling the Ottoman Empire, like, the old, like, crippled man in Europe, uh, what were the Ottomans doing during the Crimean War? So Italy had won the Italo-Turkish War and taken Libya from the Ottoman Empire. When peace was announced, the Italian elites like popular contemporary historian Cesare Causa were overjoyed. Praise be to God, we are no longer nothing. We are an old people that has found its youth and strength. We are a great nation. The majority of Italians were less enthusiastic. The war had not brought the impressive victory that they'd been promised and proved costly in blood and treasure. 3,500 Italians had died, mostly from disease, and 4,250 were wounded. The victory did little to improve Italy's military reputation with the other great powers, and its new possession was not easy to govern. Libyan Arabs would go on to resist Italian rule for years, and the Italian authorities brutally repressed them in response. Italy would also refuse to give up the Aegean Islands on the grounds of the increased costs of the Libyan occupation. For the Ottomans, losing their last African province reinforced their reputation as the so-called sick man, but they managed to save some face with the complicated arrangement in Libya and losing control of the region actually improved their finances. They suffered a similar number of military kills. So it seems like the Italians lost by winning and the Ottomans won by losing. Killed and wounded as the Italians, despite Italian military superiority. And they the lost suffering less of the Libyan people was, however, significant. And special refugee offices were set up in Constantinople for those fleeing Italian repression. The Italo Turkish War was the last typical 19th century imperial small war, but it also hinted at what was to come in 1914. It featured trenches, machine guns, airplanes, the first tactical use of armored cars, Italian torpedo boat attacks, and a stalemate, though actual combat was not comparable to the First World War. Do you think the great powers like uh, the Germans, the British, and the French were, and the Austrians, I guess, and the Russians, were the Austrians a great power? Uh, Russians were, um, right? even though they'd be overthrown in two years, but probably looked at 
this conflict from, from afar. It, I almost see some parallels to nowadays. No, not really. But I feel like we've had so much relative peace. Um, as in, like, no big wars between big powers. We've had proxy wars. We've had w big powers fight smaller powers, like Russia, Ukraine, um, like America, Vietnam, like a, a few others I'm sure I can't think of. Um, you know, the Falklands War, you could say. But th there hasn't been a great army fighting another great army directly in a long time. And it seemed like that hadn't happened uh, until World War I as well, ever since the Napoleonic Wars. Although you can say the Crimean War and the Franco-Prussian War, but uh, I, I don't think they are nearly on the scale of uh, Napoleonic Wars or World Wars, either on scale around the world or just death. Um, but um, it really does feel like, like um, China is like the Germany of World War One. This isn't like a hit on China, but and like America is like the Britain of World War One. And like China wants to be that it 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 already is and it's ascending. But I, I feel like everyone has their great, awesome new weapons, new technologies, better space. For Christ's sakes, we have like the Space Force now. Like, I feel like humanity is gearing up to try out its cool new toys again, which is what, it, um, which is what World War I felt, f kind of felt like with, like, the Germans being the ones of, like, I'm powerful now. I'm not taking a, a second seat behind France and, and the UK. And China's, like, getting really powerful now. It's like, I'm not taking a second seat behind Russia or, or behind the USA. And it... It just seems like humanity is due for a very large conflict, which is pretty scary. Um, also, the start of World War I seems so much more complicated than the start of World War II, and they seem directly connected. Like, I feel like they should both just be called the Great Storm, with the intermediate years being the eye of the storm. Um, like, the, like World War II, I feel like, was directly motivated by World War I. You know, I feel like that's the case. But I, I feel like it seems like we're entering a, a stage where a bunch of countries are fighting each other and everyone's kind of looking, and sooner or later... Big powers are going to get dragged in, and now for once we're going to try all our new weapons against each other, big powers, and that's not a hopeful thought. The war also saw a guerrilla force successfully resist a larger and more powerful conventional force, which obligated the stronger power to seek victory by means other than a decisive battle. Like, I feel like we could be, sorry, pausing again. I feel like these conflicts with Israel-Palestine, with Russia and Ukraine, with the possibility of a Taiwan-China, um, all could be a could be looked at in the future as stuff like the Italo-Turkish War or the um, some of the Balkan Wars, and that's not. I'm not trying to be pessimistic. I can't force this stuff to happen. I'm just saying what I feel. In fact, the very Any same thoughts? Senussi Arabs would also fight with the Ottomans in 1914 to 1918. The war in the air influenced military thought. In fact, the war was referenced in the founding charter of the British Royal Flying Corps. And of course, the Dardanelles would also be a key objective of the British in 1915. The Italo-Turkish War, just as Austria had feared, did indeed destabilize the Balkans and helped bring about the Balkan Wars. Giolitti himself had worried about just such a scenario in 1911. 
The integrity of the Ottoman Empire is a condition for Europe's balance and peace. Is it truly in Italy's interest to shatter into pieces one of the cornerstones of the old building? And what if, after we attack Turkey, the Balkans move as well? And what if a Balkan war causes a clash among the groups of powers and a European war? Could we take upon ourselves the responsibility for igniting the gunpowder? The Italo Turkish. I see this. And I think about this sometimes and uh, about like, um, you know, Ethiopia wanting to get a coastline on the Red Sea and 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 uh, getting very friendly with a Somali, a section of Somalia that's on the Red Sea that doesn't that is kind of apart from the what you can call the normal Somali government. Um, it, it's something like this. It's like. As someone from America, I benefit from the status quo. And also, ever, I can say, nobody wants more death. Nobody wants um, the borders to be messed up and countries vying for new borders. But at the same time, if I'm not America, if I'm not China, if I'm not Russia, if I'm not... Brazil or Australia, these enormous countries with vast resources, then I'm like, okay, so you don't want war between a bunch of countries because you want to avoid deadly conflict and a disruption of the world order, right? But if I'm not one of those large countries, then it's like, okay, so you don't want me to start war to get my territory like you have your territory and so I can be powerful like you? And yet you don't want to give us any of your land. And if I'm a small country like Ethiopia, uh, Ethiopia is not that small, uh, both in population and size, but it doesn't have a port and ports are super important. I'm not saying I, I think Ethiopia should invade Somalia, okay? But you can't be the bigger man and say all of this stuff, like what happened with it, Italy going in Turkey and fighting in the Balkans could lead to greater conflict. You can't say that as if you're the parent and you're the good guy worrying and then also hold all of the resources, all of the power, and just want to keep that influence and power over the veil of you don't want death. Right, Not to say that you tr truly, legitimately, honestly don't want death and destruction, but if I'm a smaller country, especially a small landlocked country, if you don't want me to start conflict, then, then, then change borders around more fairly so countries can, can build wealth with resources. It, do you know what I mean? It's just, it's just, okay, if you don't want the wider conflict and you're going to blame smaller countries who want land and want to be powerful like you for creating the conflict? Well, aren't you also creating the conflict by not recognizing their uh, handicaps of becoming a powerful nation like you and just your only excuse being will disrupt the world order and a lot of people will die? My response would be, okay, then give me some of your land. As an American, I would say no, but I'm not going to hide behind a veil of, we can't do it. It's, it's, it's going to destroy everything. It will, but you, are, you won the roll of the dice. So now borders are set. Now this is the resources that you get are the ones inside your territory. I am mad. I, am, I feel... I feel disrespected highly um and i say hey um if you want peace then let other countries be able to be prosperous like you you are prosperous because you killed you slaughtered you conquered and now you still get those borders and we can't get those borders because now it's now the the game's over I don't get that. I don't want world war and death. 
but I can't with good conscience say that it's unfair of us to, to want the status quo while we have the amazing uh, place in the status quo because of the shit we're the stuff we're trying others to tell them not to do. Does that make sense? That's something I've, I've thought Move about. as well. And what if a Balkan war causes a clash among the groups of powers and a European war? Could we take upon ourselves the responsibility for igniting the gunpowder? The Italo-Turkish war alone did not start the First World War, but it was one of the sparks that lit the long fuse of 1914. We want to thank Mark Newton and... Imagine being Great Britain or America today, but I'm going to use Great Britain at this time because Great Britain, I would say, was much more powerful in 1911, 1912 than America was in 1912. But imagine Britain coming over and saying, hey, no, 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 no. We can't disrupt it. We can't have death respect borders and then be like the only reason you're rich is because of the stuff you did in the past of all of all of your colonies and then the british being like yeah well that happened a while ago okay then give me some of that again i would still say no but i wouldn't i would say it directly and not hide behind well do you know what i mean how just angering that would be it's like so you get to keep you get to keep the treasures from your killing and raping and destruction while while telling us not not to to conquer i i just don't i if anything you guys could comment on please comment on on that point there uh yeah so it's a great video guys as always great war fantastic video love you all hope you guys are all doing well and um uh would love if you liked and subscribed, and I'd really appreciate it if uh, if I can see you guys next video. We can keep learning. All right, bye guys.